Okay, hello everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for our grad track workshop. We're very happy to have Dr. Edwards here tonight to give us some insights on um, writing an effective literature review. Um, how many people here tonight are graduate students? Okay, great. So you got this from the graduate student list. Um, the grad track series, I think you know, it's workshops. We also have a research guide, so I hope you make use of all those resources that we have for you in the library. We also try to be very responsive, so that if there's any topics that you would like us to cover or do workshops on, please let me know. Email me, I'm Nancy Garmer, and garmer at fit.edu, because we would love to do workshops that are gonna help you directly as students. So please do try to be interactive, and we'll try to teach you what you need to know. So I will introduce Dr. Edwards, and she will begin the workshop. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you all for coming out on a Thursday evening. This is quite a nice turnout. So I hope this will be helpful to you. I know um, one of the things that you all have to do as graduate students at one point or another, whether it's for a research paper or your thesis or dissertation, um, and even for those undergraduates who are here on some of your research papers, is write a literature review. And we, as professors, say, go write a literature review, <laughs> right? And that's it, right? So this is kind of helpful. I know I was a student at one time, too, and I got the same thing. Go write a literature review. What does that mean? So what I did was, what probably most of you have done, is go to uh, research papers, articles that have literature reviews. You can tell because they are usually subtitled literature <laughs> review, right? And read those and try to figure out, okay, that's what they're talking about. But it's still, you know, unless and until you start doing it and practicing it, it can be a real challenge. And so is that what some of you are finding? Yes, okay, this is a common thing. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. So why do we write literature reviews? This is an interactive part, okay. <laughs> For those of you on video, you can say it out loud to yourself. Um, why? Not just because the professor tells you to. Yes? To support the research that you're about to explain and why you did it. Okay. Okay, so, so to support the research that you're about to do and tell us why it's important. Okay, so part of that is supporting. How do we do that? What, how is a literature review supportive of your research? Yes? You analyze what the author is saying and you basically put it into the message is getting across to you and you kind of put your research behind that and back it up with that information about the author. Okay, so you take what the author of the article that you're reviewing and you apply it to your own research. Okay, all right. What else? <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about it then. <laughs> if we don't know why, that really can be a challenge in actually doing it, right? So we are trying to support our, our research, but in doing that, we need to be able to say, this is what has been done before my research, right? So we're looking at literature um, in our field, in our subject that we're, that we're trying to write on and, and the research that we're doing, and we're saying, okay, let's see who has done research on this topic and where can we go um, and, and, and what have they done and what have they found, right? And we do that because our research, and many of your professors have told you that our research needs to be new, right? It can't be just something that's already been done. It needs to be something that is new and fresh and adds to the body of work for that field. Right? So that's your purpose. So unless we know what's already there, it's hard for us to add to it. Okay? And so that's what the literature review is helping us to do. So, um, so Marshall and Rossman, back in 1989, so long ago, um, <laughs> uh, told us 
you know, here are some key, four key points as to why we write literature reviews. What is the function of that literature review? So it illustrates the underlying research paradigm. What's a paradigm? Boy, you are really not interactive. To wake up. I know it's <laughs> Thursday night, but we're almost at the end of this of the week. What is a paradigm? is how we look at the world, okay? How we um, structure our research, what um, you know, theoretical foundations are we using? And so when we are doing research we, uh, on a particular topic, we want to know from what perspective, what worldview we are looking at this particular topic. So in my field, my field is mass communication. And there are a number of different paradigms that you can look at communication, um, re where, how you can look at communication research. And the paradigm that you use is often going to in, uh, indicate what types of methods you're going to use, um, what uh, type of, of questions you're even going to ask. And so, again, for my field in communication, if I am looking at uh, media from a media effects perspective um, and using that dominant paradigm, then I'm probably going to use um, very objective types of, of research. I will be um, maybe running some experiments and, and, and doing that kind of, of research, whereas if I look at um, a research question from a cultural studies perspective, I'll probably doing more, uh, be doing more um, qualitative research, maybe some um, interviews and focus groups and in-depth analysis of, of, of texts or of the media. And so it really matters what paradigm you're, you're looking at and, and coming from in your re in when you're doing your literature review. So, okay, so that's your first, the, the first purpose, um, or first function. Secondly, it shows that you know the research related to your topic, okay? So, when, you're, um, when you write your literature review, you need to be able to indicate to show that you know what has been done, that you know the literature, and this is um, certainly, um, as a graduate student, your professors want to be able to see in your thesis that you've done your homework, that you've done the research that you need to do. And so they'll have you, um, you know, continuing to, to look up studies that are, have done similar things to what you are, are doing. In doing that, you identify gaps in that research that, um, uh, that your study will then attempt to fill, okay? So when you are, you, you say, uh, you know, Gerbner looked at, at uh, cultivation effects of television, right? But no one has looked at cultivation effects of social media, right? So that's what I'm going to do. And so we can look, we can uh, really make an argument do that support that you were talking about um, for, your, for your study by identifying what is missing, okay? And that helps, helps that. And then finally, it provides an argument for your research questions or your hypotheses by giving them context. You're contextualizing your study, your questions through your, um, th through the literature review and showing how you're making a contribution um, from your study to all of this, this body of work. The underlying theory or theories should be prominent in your literature review, okay? And that's often how you organize that literature review. All right, so your literature review should answer a number of questions, and this also comes from that, uh, that uh, article that I, I mentioned before. When, what research has already been done on this topic? Okay, that's a big one. What particular areas of the topic has this previous research concentrated? 
Okay, so if you've got, um, you know, sometimes there are lots of, of things that you, maybe you're studying a topic that has a lot of research. So you've got to figure out, okay, what specific areas have been done, um, have been studied in this particular, for this particular topic. In other studies, and other projects that you're working on, you may find that there's really not a whole lot, right? And so that's something that you're going to illustrate through the research, but you've got to do the, um, you, you've got to do the searching for that literature to make sure that you're not missing something, and that can, that can happen too. That's why you come to the library and you talk to the wonderful uh, folks here who can help you find and make sure that you're not missing something. And then, of course, what are the gaps in the research or new ways of looking at the problem, right? So you can take a look um, at what other research has been, has been done, and then you can say, hey, I've got a new way of looking at this. Maybe this is, I've got a new method that I want to use to look at this particular problem. Other questions that your it look, review should answer, um, what methods were used? to do the research, okay? Again, that goes to the paradigm. Um, it goes to, are you going to be extending that kind of research, or are you do, gonna be doing something a little bit new? Um, are there new methods that are available to do this research? Um, and again, in my field, I study media. So there are times where um, a lot, maybe a lot of research has been done on a particular topic, but in an older channel, a, an older medium, like television or, or newspapers, and now we're shifting and we can look at that same idea, that same concept, through the lens of the internet or social media. And so you find, you know, as we progress technologically, we find that we there are new ways to look at similar problems. And so we can identify that through our literature review. And then, of course, how will your research build on or depart from current and previous research on the topic that you are looking at? Okay, so you are um, you, you're you're constantly um, talking about the literature and and comparing it, being able to talk about it in terms of how does it fit in with your own research. All right, so. A literature review is a synthesis, not a summary of the research. And here's another area where professors say, write a literature review and make sure you synthesize the literature. And you go, okay, what does that mean? And again, you go back and you're, and that can be really, um, challenging. How many of you really truly get synthesizing the literature? Okay, how many of you really have questions about it? Okay, I'm getting hands. <laughs> like, I'm not sure if you're actually listening, but um, <laughs> that helps. Okay, so if we think about a synthesis, and do I have any chemists in here? No, no chemistry, okay. Maybe they don't, oh, oh you're a yeah, kind, kind of. of. Yeah, okay, so there's synthesis in chemistry, right? You combine chemicals and then you synthesize mm -hmm. and they create something new. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that's the idea, right? I am not a chemist, mm -hmm. I, I don't, but I know enough to know that there is synthesis yeah, yeah, that yeah. happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I do occasionally bake, and I bought a bunch of stuff the other day uh, that I am gonna make some muffins. And um, so if we think about a literature review like a recipe and like baking, we can have our ingredients, right? Mm -hmm. And if we think about it, the literature that you have, your references, is your list of ingredients, okay? And um, th that's great but it's really not helping me with my muffins, right? It's not creating a muffin, and you want to create your cake or whatever, um, and so you've got to start putting those things together. And so the literature review ultimately is that mixing of things together, putting them together so that they are, are a cohesive form and that they 
even though they're all different parts, they are, are they're making um, a statement that is clear, okay? So it's not quite clear here yet. Um, it's still, you know, the money places. So you're, you're, you, you, you start putting them all together. And then finally, in your, when you finally work out that synthesis and you're toward the end of your literature review, you have your nicely baked muffins. So we're gonna get to how are we going to actually do that, okay? All right, so one of the things, um, we're gonna go through this and then I've got um, a, a, a sort of way for you to do that, um, that, that kind of workshopping aspect of it. So you want to start, as you, you, you've read all this stuff, you've got your lovely, lovely list of references and you have gone through and, and looked at it all and now you gotta figure out okay, synthesize, I gotta put things together. How am I gonna do that? So you organize it by themes, right? You find the common thing, themes among the literature that you're reviewing. Um, you summarize those works through those, from the context of those themes, um, and as you're writing the literature review, you introduce each theme. Usually when I'm writing, I have these little subheads that are the themes that I'm using. Um, and so I, I, I introduce the whole thing as this is what I'm gonna talk about and then have little um, subheads for each of the big, of the sort of um, themes that come under that big umbrella. And so introducing the theme, talking about, you know, here are the, here's the research and, the, the, and, and how it sort of fits together um, and, and give it, uh, that context within the topic area that you are that are you're writing on, um, you conclude each theme, and then uh, you uh, review and assess what you've written to see if it's all flowing together. Um, and you do this for each one of them. Um, all right, so let's take a look at it. Um, the North Carolina State University has this lovely handout that um, I have a link to, and I don't know if you all will have this, but um, there's a link to it um, that has this wonderful handout about how to write a literature review that I've, I've taken this from. It's such a nice little tool to use. So if you think about um, as you're going through your literature, and I still do my literature reviews very, much the old-fashioned way and that I read through uh, an article and I take notes on that article and I usually actually hand write them which is a little antiquated I know but um, um, but I, you know then I have this huge sheet of paper and this is a great way to try and do that whether you're doing it electronically or by hand um, of keeping those notes and you think about what are your main ideas what are the themes that you're using and you have your themes here and then you have your different sources here. So your sources are your ingredients, right? If we go back to that recipe, um, your sources are your ingredients, and so you've got each one. And then under your um, each main idea, you it's your prep. That's your starting to mix it. You haven't quite mixed it together, but you're prepping. And so you're developing and taking notes on each of your sources and how they relate to your topic area, your theme, okay? So, <clears throat> I don't wanna get too close to this. It, it, it can it actually take a life of its own if I get too close. So, um, so if you're, you're, think about it in terms of your main idea is, is, is a theme and you're taking each source, you're taking notes, that can give you um, your ingredients that you're gonna work with to start to mix together, okay? It's not the raw ingredients anymore because now you've cut them up, right? You, you've, you've cut up the, um, well, I'm making pumpkin and chocolate chip muffins, so that's not really gonna help. But if you're making soup, right? You've cut up the onion and the, and the celery. Um, so this is everything that's all nice and cut up and you've got everything ready to go and so um, so you can put it together. So I took one of the art, one of my articles, and I, I tried to pull some um, some of the ideas. Um, this is from an article I wrote um, that was the the main idea, the main topic area was the audience response to health me health messages on a television show. 
Okay, and so I took a paragraph from my literature review that was based on a, a theme, and it, me, it was media as frames to help people understand the world. Okay, and so <coughs> I looked at um, Lindelof and Meyer, and they said media provide frames for understanding life concerns and experiences. Okay, and so you know, I said, okay, that. You know, they're talking about that. That's what it is. And, and so if you, you know, if I were to go further, you know, this would be a long page of things that I pulled from Lindelof and Meyer that related to that idea. Okay, then I did the same thing with Janus from 1980. It's really old, but very um, pertinent. People use what they see on television to help guide their actions um, in similar real life situations. You know, and that's what uh, Janus found um, was that the reason people watch uh, um, television and some of the shows that we think are really kind of, why would you watch that? Is so that they can learn how to respond in real life situations. So you know, I always wonder how that works in um, uh, a soap opera, right? <laughs> and all the crazy things that happen. Is that ever gonna really happen to you? Um, okay, so Janice fi does this and finds th this in, in her research. And Hal found that screening for cervical cancer, so here I'm progressing, media frames, um, uh, media use frames to help people understand the world, and people use them in that way. Um, and this is getting more specific to my health messages, right? Where I'm looking at that same idea with um, the idea that this particular, Hal and his colleagues found that screening for cervical cancer increased increased in the United Kingdom after a character on a soap opera was diagnosed and then later died from that disease. And so people, after watching this, were then going out and getting screened. So here we're really seeing that in that action, that things happening um, it, uh, that are really connecting with these other things. And then Lamal and Van de Volk, uh, in 2010 found health uh, related message embedded in a narrative had a greater effect on subsequent health behaviors than did a non-narrative message, okay? And so again, we're progressing, we're sort of getting the big picture. Now, I, I, it was easy for me to do this because it was already written, so <laughs> yours is gonna be a lot more messy. Um, you're gonna have to um, pull this, you know, it might not be this progression, right? You're gonna have to find that progression. But it, you'll, you'll be able to see it and be able to pull it out if you can um, do this. You know, the, a, lot of, a lot of us are visual learners and, visual, and it's nice for us to be able to visualize and see, see how this works. So how this worked for my paper, I know you can't read it, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and do this with, but you know, putting it all together, and it wasn't just those, uh, those articles, right? I've got a few more citations in here. But I said, media effects research indicates that media provide frames for understanding life concerns and experiences. People use vicarious experiences from television to help guide their actions in similar real life situations. Okay, and, so, and you'll note, I, quote, I uh, quoted Lindloff and Meyer there, then I cited Janice here. <coughs> and then going on, health issues embedded in television programming can have an impact on viewer knowledge and behaviors. And then you see this whole string, right? There are a number of people, of researchers, who found this same idea in their research. And so I cite them all. Brody and his colleagues, or her colleagues, Collins and colleagues, and Howe and colleagues. All of them did that, right? And so I can, I've, I've condensed, I've, I've synthesized those ideas into that sentence that then I can cite all of them. Okay, um, for example, so, so here I've got the broad idea, right? The big idea of the conceptualization, the theoretical foundation. And then I say, here's an example of this, right? I don't have to talk about every single one of those articles and every single one of the uh, pieces of research that I've read. I can just say, here's what they have all found and Look, this is a specifically an example of something that was found. So for example, how found that screening for cervical cancer increased in the United Kingdom, which is what we, I talked about earlier, on soap operas and so forth. 
right, the power of the narrative to evoke positive responses to health messages was supported by a study by Lamal and Vandebroek, right, who found a health-related message embedded in a narrative had a greater effect on subsequent health behaviors than did a non-narrative message about the same health concern. The researchers used web-based web messages for the experiment. The non-narrative group showed no difference from the control group. Okay, so you see again how it's I'm integrating the um, the research and the methods that are being used. Okay, and so the um, you you'll you see this sort of thematically through um, through most literature reviews that you're going to read in that they're not just summarizing. You, you'll notice I didn't go and say Lindloff and Meyer found this, and they did this study and they um, you know, had 23 participants and you know, the whole thing. And I, and I get those papers sometimes from students because again, they, 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 they're still learning and they haven't done it much before. And so it's a paragraph on each one of the studies on, and what, they, what that study did. And ultimately, what I want and what your professors likely want to see is that you take those little summaries that you've done of those, um, uh, of, of those studies that you've read and integrate them into a more cohesive uh, structure for your paper, for your literature review. Um, okay, so I have another example from the same paper if you want, I can go through it, but are there questions right now? Is this helpful? <laughs> Yes? Okay, all right. So you want me to go through another one real quick? And um, again, this is, this is from a larger work. It's from an article. So, so this is sort of, you know, multiplied <laughs> multiple times, right? So um, this is, um, here is I, a little further on in the same paper where I talk about the um, theoretical perspective and the methodological perspective I'm going to use for this paper. And so um, while the early part talks about the broader research and if we think about the paradigm like I was talking about before, maybe a, um, the same paradigm but a little bit um, broader uh, perspective, <coughs> and here I'm narrowing it down as to how I'm looking at this. How, and so this is what you want to do with yours is how are you, you know, what, um, upon what body of literature are you building your own research? And so here um, my main idea is, is the research methods in um, audience studies. And so because this is an audience study. And so I looked to Carrie back in 1975 and you notice, okay, so the dates on these things, these are really old. Do you want to use a whole bunch of really old stuff? Mm -hmm. No, you want to find the newest stuff. When is it important to use the really old stuff? Historical documents, like historical research. Okay, but even when it's not historical. like the new field or old field that means nobody mentioned or nobody to study it after that. Okay, so maybe there hasn't been a whole lot yeah. since they did it and that happens. That's what, Sometimes people just forget about studies that have been done and all of a sudden you find them and you're like, why hasn't anybody done this? Yeah. Right? So that can happen. But there's also a time when you want to use this because these are the people who were the foundational people who did the work, who built the theory, who built this body of, of, of research, right? And so often, you might want to go all the way back to that foundational study um, that, was, that was so important that maybe launched all of um, this, all of this. There's a, um, again, in my field, uh, agenda setting. We are always citing the agenda setting folks who started, started it, but then there's been so much research uh, on that topic that we then you want to go to the more recent stuff, right? So, um, but you also want to be able to show that you are, are, you understand 
that historical perspective of the and how your topic has progressed, right? And so that can give you um, that foundation as well by going back and getting some of the more the the older um, documents, the older literature that can help you um, to do that. Now, one of the great things about um, some of this and some of the researchers that you probably use is some of these researchers have been around for a long time. And so maybe they did have a foundational paper that they did back in 1975, but they've written more recently and have this great piece on the history of it, right? And we find those quite a bit too. And you want to look for that, um, that kind of, of literature uh, for your literature review that can help you build without having to go through and, and use every single piece for, for, your li for, for your literature. All right, so Carrie says cultural studies research looks at how an audience interprets messages, um, not necessarily intended meaning, um, and he talks about ritual versus transmission of, of messages. Fisk talks about audiences' use of uh, audiences use cultural values to um, interpret messages and go beyond the actual in intended meaning. Um, Hall, um, Stuart Hall said uh, communication is not a single process but two processes where you have the encoder who is creating the message and the decoder who is interpreting the message. Um, and, um, and then uh, Costa Alzuru put all of that to, um, to work in a study that she did. Con um, she conducted an audience analysis of girls and their interpretations of the American Girl dolls. Um, she, and she talked about how audiences exist in a complex social structure and use qualitative methods. Okay, so how did that turn out? Research from a ritual perspective is grounded in a cultural studies approach to studying communication, citing Carey, 1975. It necessitates an understanding of how an audience interprets the communication going beyond the source and intended message to the audience's negotiated meaning. While the message creator and the message are important factors, the implications of the communication as a social force are best understood through the audience interpretation. And there we cite Carrie, 1975, and then C also. And the C also is important here as well where you can say, here's the, the study that I'm, I'm, I'm citing, but these other people have done similar things, right? So you might want to go to those as well. You might even want to look at those when you're doing your literature review and finding stuff to include. Is If somebody says see also, that's a clue for you. Maybe you do want to see also. Um, okay, so see also Fisk, Hall, and Newcomb. I didn't have Newcomb on my other page because it couldn't fit and I wanted you to be able to maybe see it. Um, uh, reception studies see, for example, Acosta Alzuru, which is on the other page, but I didn't include Duke and Kreschel uh, and Radway uh, and Vargas, all of whom did audience research that I reviewed for the literature, um, but didn't, again, didn't go step by step of this is what they said. You know, Duke and Kreschel looked at um, how young girls look, um, use and interpret the meaning of, um, of uh, teen magazines, right? They interviewed them and, and did qualitative methods <coughs> with them. Uh, but I didn't write that, right? Uh, Radway uh, asked p women who read romance novels, is why do you, what do you get out of it? Why do you read these romance novels? Um, again, an audience study that I don't have to write all that stuff about what she did. Um, I'm just, I just tell the reader here that these are the types of studies that are happening. And um, Vargas looked at uh, use of, of uh, I think it was low power radio stations um, <coughs> in, uh, 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 I think, uh, Hispanic communities. I'm not exactly, I, I, I have to go back and look. Um, okay, so, the, so reception studies embody the communication and social process approach. Again, going to that paradigmatic um, perspective as to how, where is this study situated. Um, the communication and social process approach to study 
intriguing audiences, starting with the premise that communication and audiences exist within a complex social structure and therefore must be studied within that structure. Okay, so you get that, that idea that, um, that you don't have to give a summary of everything. You're synthesizing, you're putting those ingredients together to give you a cohesive, nice synthesized literature review. All right, so what comes after you've written the literature review um, and how do you connect it to the rest of your paper? So one of the things that I tell my students is that uh, you, you should be making the argument throughout your literature review that um, so that when you get to the end and you state your research questions, which is what you need to do, state your research questions and your hypotheses, that it makes sense. That somebody who has read your literature review says, oh, okay, they're making that hypothesis because all these studies found this, right? Um, or if you are making a hypothesis that's going against all the other research that's been done, you've made an argument as to why you think something has changed, okay? And so you, you need to, that's what you're doing with your literature review. It's an argument, it's a way to, to make a case for the study that you are conducting. All right, so you're connecting the literature to your study, you're introducing your research questions and the hypotheses, and you're transitioning into the methods. And hopefully you've built enough into your literature review that the methods you're gonna use will make sense as well. Okay, so, um, and you often, you know, may reference back to your literature review and your methods because you've already set it up as to how other people have studied this topic before. Does that make sense? All right, so some examples, like I said, NCSU's um, writing and speaking tutorial service had that matrix and, and using the matrix, they use a t completely different um, example, but they do use an example also um, that, that looks at different literature pieces and puts together, um, puts it together, so that you have a, a, you know, a little paragraph of what that can look like. Um, Ehow.com has how to write a literature review in APA style format. Um, that's what I use. Uh, you can probably find something on similar for in, in other formats. Um, what kinds of styles? do you use? I, I know, well, all the psychology folks and ABA people use APA <laughs> um, as, as I do. What what kinds of styles do you all use? MLA, APA, MLA, MLA Chicago. <laughs> so Chicago, MLA, okay. Um, yeah, some of the, some of our... Purdue Owl and Citation Machine. Purdue Owl great. is great, yes. I love Purdue Owl. I send my students to that as well. Our library has some resources also. Um, it's an APA style guide. A yeah, we have the APA style central style database. Central. Yes, that's a database that's for, for free. Refworks does it here, so. And, and yeah, Refworks is great. Be careful with those because um, it doesn't always format exactly the way it is supposed to. <laughs> so they're great, I love them because I'll, I'll pull, but then you've got to go through and make sure that it's pulled it the right way and that, you know, whatever, um, and they're all different <laughs> and it's so crazy, but, um, you know, are you using the right uh, uh, sentence style or, or title style or however you're doing that? And then the article that I used for the matrix example is there as well. So what questions do you all have? Um, what did I not talk about that you really wanted me to talk about? Yes? Is there any specific format or there is just any like methodological select format and outline something like that for specific abilities? So, so here's where disciplines matter, um, but yes, so, so when you are thinking about the, as, you, as you're organizing it, you want to introduce your problem, right? And you, usually before the literature review, you've got an introduction. 
So your introduction should sort of summarize what, what, what's the issue, what's the problem, what is the, um, uh, and you know, what is the sort of big picture, how are you looking at the problem, and what have things, what studies have been done. Um, and then you go into, from the introduction, you go into your literature review. I like to see a little summary of the literature review at the top of the literature review underneath the introduction, okay? So for example, <coughs> when you have looked at the literature and you've found your themes, you want to find out, you want to identify, um, you know, what those themes are and then, um, you're going to talk in, in, the, in the little summary introduction to the literature review and say, you know, this uh, health communication research embodies a number of different um, perspectives. This, partic this paper looks at uh, health communication from the theoretical perspectives of, of audience research um, media as frames, and uh, I don't know, I don't remember. <laughs> um, but, but so you have a little introduction of what each of your subheads are going to be. Okay, so if you've identified your themes in your, in your introduction to the literature review, you, you introduce all those little subheads. Okay, and then you go into, this, into the themes. So theme one. You know, this is one particular topic area that, that and how, how researchers have looked at it, okay? And then theme two, this is another area in which it's uh, how um, the researchers, and this is how researchers have looked at it. And then theme three and so, so on and so forth. So however many of those that you have. Um, I've been on a number of, of um, ABA and psych uh, committees where you have lots of them, right? Because you're, um, maybe you're doing uh, a number of different tests <coughs> that you're putting through. So each one of those, you're gonna have a little subhead, a subsection for each of those themes. So, um, and then, as you're wrapping up your literature review, you do a little, you know, summary close, but you lead it into those research questions and hypotheses. Now, if you're not writing a full research, like if you're not doing a <coughs> thesis or a dissertation, you're just sort of writing a, a research paper that consists of primarily that literature review, what would be a good way to end that? What would, what would be a good way? You're not doing your own study, at least not yet. So, what might be a good? <laughs> Summarize everything like a introduction. <coughs> okay. Yeah. You can. Yeah. I mean, that, that's nice. A nice way to do a conclusion. Um, for for this kind of paper, though, I like to see you talk about, and and I think probably your professors and readers want to see you talk about what's next? What should we do with all of this knowledge, right? Your opinion, if it's all supporting of your identity. It can be opinion. Um, yes? The gap. The gap, yeah. What, what, what are the gaps? Where, where, what's missing, right? Now, if you're writing your thesis or dissertation, you're telling them what's missing and you're telling them you're going to fill that, right? But if you're not, then you want to identify oh, to, and tell other people, here's what's missing. This is what research should be done. This is, um, and this is maybe, you might even want to say that opinion, this is where I think this is going, right? And so, um, but again, that's more, if you're not going to continue on with your own <laughs> with your own study, uh, but but just fi finalizing and summarizing and providing some context of what's happening in, in the state of the um, of the research today and where do you think it, what what future research should be done? 
um, there. That's how you're going to end your dissertation and, and thesis, right, anyway. You're going to finish it and you're going to have done all of these things, but of course you're going to find all of these other things that could be done more. So, um, so ultimately you're going to get to that at the end of your, of your full uh, thesis or dissertation. Um, but if you're just writing it, um, it's a nice way to, to summarize and, and to, to end that as well. All right. Yes? Uh, what could be the main um, difference between introduction and uh, literature review? So the main difference <coughs> between the introduction and literature review, one, the introduction is much condensed, right? Um, and you, you're kind of summarizing some of what you're going to be talking about in the literature review. You're providing some context. Um, the introduction is going to be pretty explicit about the problem that you are going to address and, um, and, and why it's important, okay? So, so you're going to make, um, you're, the introduction is also an argument, right? Everything is, you're, you're trying to make a case for something. So the introduction is your argument for, um, for why is this study even important? You're answering the so what question. And then you're telling everyone, um, you know, as you get to the end of the introduction, you're giving them a little bit of a preview and saying, okay, the rest of this paper is going to talk about these things, right? So we call that an advanced organizer. Um, so as you get to the end of a, a section, you provide an advanced organizer that tells the reader, here's what you can look forward to, right? It's like a tease on television. Next week, right? <laughs> Next section. What else? <laughs> In the case of uh, experimental thesis, is it correct to put the main results of your experiments in the introduction? Usually, uh, well, and, and here's where it can get discipline specific. Um, Usually, no, but often you do put it in your abstract, depending on the abstract. Um, yeah, you, it's, d discipline is going to probably m make a difference here as to whether you do. What I would do is look at, see what other people have done. Um, but usually in, in mine, you don't see the results yet. Yeah, you might see it in the abstract, though. What's the difference between an abstract and an introduction? I hear mumbling, mumbling, mumbling. You can put citations in the abstract. Most of the abstracts don't have. Uh, Most of them don't. Yeah. Don't. Mm -hmm. Right. But but yes, but no. <laughs> Yeah, the abstract, even though it's really, <laughs> you gotta cram a lot into a little bit, and you don't have a lot of room, it's a really short, short thing. Um, you know, one paragraph, and often you're limited on that. Um, although there are extended abstracts, I shouldn't say that, there are extended ones, but most of them are pretty short because you're reading them, right? You're going and, as you're looking for the literature that you're gonna review, you're reading those abstracts, so you know they're short, but they usually do contain that um, information of, about really pretty much the whole thing to tell you whether or not you want to go forward and read this. All right, other questions? Nancy, you had a question. I did have a question. Um, I noticed when you were putting your themes up there in your matrix that they weren't, the research wasn't necessarily in chronological order. So when you're doing a progression, is it usually chronological or not necessarily when you're doing the literature review? It really depends on what you're working on. Um, <coughs> yeah, I didn't even think about that. I could have put it in chronological. Um, for me, it's just this. This is just a tool. If you are doing a sort of a chronology of 
the work that's been done, more of, more of a historical perspective, doing it in that way would be very helpful. Um, um, and if, I usually don't because that's not how I structure mine. Um, but but it can, it, it, especially if you're looking at um, and providing that historical look at at, <coughs> at the research, um, and and especially if you have a lot of, of studies that have built on one on another. What I've found in my research is that while studies do kind of build on each other, they're they're very distinct. Um, and so, uh, so I don't necessarily see that. But there certainly is the research, as I said, with the agenda setting research, there's certainly a progression of how that has, has gone. Um, but there are also a number of articles that show you that progression pretty well, too. But excellent question. I'll rearrange that next time. Well, so it doesn't necessarily have to be, though. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. And, um, what you might want to do with a matrix like that is, um, because usually I'll just, I'll say, oh, this is a great article, and I'll start going through it. And so it doesn't, but if you're doing this, not as I do sometimes, you know, handwritten, um, if you're doing this electronically, um, it might be helpful for you to do it however you find the literature and then rearrange it chronologically and see what you see. And that can be very eye-opening, too to be able to, to look at the progression of, of that. It's the beauty of electronic, um, being able to move things around. It can be like this, you say, it can be arranged by the dates, is it? Or just, it should be like that, is it? Your matrix can be arranged by the date. So, um, what she was talking about, this. Yeah. Okay. So, doing that. It may not make sense so, and here's where writing up your literature, and we're going back to the idea of synthesizing, is that it might make sense for it to be um, done chronologically, but most, mostly when you're trying to do the synthesis, you're going to not do that, right? You're going to find the big, bigger picture so that you can put those things together. And so I would, be, I would hesitate to try to build your literature review chronologically, but building this chronologically so that you can, again, that visual, you know, really see the progression of things, <coughs> um, how, how the, they work. Um, and one of the reasons is <coughs> these are all, while well, they're all communication researchers, they're also all in different areas, and so Carrie, as cultural studies, um, or did cultural studies. Fisk was more of a rhetorician, um, and, and Carrie was more media. Uh, Fisk was more rhetor a rhetorician, and so um, he was looking more from a, the perspective of, of public speaking and messages that are built that way. Um, Hall is more of a critical cultural scholar um, from a different, uh, and, and looking at things from a different perspective. And Acosta Uzuru is um, also a critical cultural uh, scholar, but she her her work, um, while Call, Hall is more media studies, um, Acosta Uzuru is more from a public relations kind of uh, perspective, and um, and and cultural. Um, I mean, she's a mass communication researcher as well. She's actually done a lot of stuff on. Um, uh, the uh, circuit of culture and the creation of um, telenovelas from Venezuela. She's from Venezuela, and so she's done a lot of really interesting work on that. But um, so, so in this instance, it really it's not necessary, although it's helpful. It could be helpful to, to show it from that perspective. Other questions? Well, are you excited? <laughs>